Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Legislative and Regulatory Updates panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I would like to thank our gold sponsor, Chapman, Kubine, Allen, and Hosey. This session will include pre-recorded presentations, followed by a live Q&A after with our panelists. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Kate Delewski is the Senior Policy Advisor at the Animal Welfare Institute. She previously worked at Born Free USA and for the past seven years has lobbied at the federal and state levels on issues pertaining to wildlife. Since joining AWI, she has been closely involved with efforts to protect the Endangered Species Act from congressional and regulatory assaults, led coalitions advocating for federal bills to protect wild animals in captivity, and partnered with organizations across the country to push state legislation addressing performing exotic animals, wildlife trafficking, and trapping, among other issues. Mimi Brody has been the Director of Federal Affairs at the Humane Society Legislative Fund and the Humane Society of the United States since 1999, helping enact a broad range of pro-animal legislation, defend against hostile efforts, and seek strong enforcement of animal protection laws affecting companion animals, farmed animals, animals in research, and wildlife. To attract diverse congressional support, she links animal protection issues to other concerns, such as the environment, public health, food safety, national security, and budget savings. Kathy Schatzman is the Senior Legislative Affairs Manager at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Before joining ALDF, Kathy worked as the New Jersey Senior State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, where she worked to strengthen animal protection laws on the local, state, and federal levels. Her previous achievements include serving on the governor-appointed New Jersey Animal Welfare Task Force as a board member for the New Jersey Animal Welfare Federation and an advisor to New Jersey Voters for Animals. Now we'll begin with a presentation from Kate. Hello, my name is Kate Delewski. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Animal Welfare Institute, and I'm really pleased and honored to be here today to talk to you about protecting the earth and protecting animals, specifically the intersection of climate and biodiversity policy over the past few years. I wanna start with a brief overview of the biodiversity crisis. I don't think this is news to any of you that we are in a pivotal moment of species decline that some scientists have called the sixth mass extinction. And unfortunately, over the past several decades, the population sizes of mammals, fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles have dropped an average of 68% in population size. Now, this alarming situation was really captured well by the report I have on this slide which is from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This was released in May 2019 and was a huge wake up call to a lot of people around the world. It described unprecedented and accelerating global mass extinctions caused by human activity and said that shockingly, one million species worldwide are at risk, risk of extinction and many of those could be extinct within just a few decades. Unsurprisingly, it lists climate change as among the top five leading direct drivers of species decline. And this quote by one of the co-chairs of the report really sums it up well. The essential interconnected web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. This loss is a direct result of human activity and constitutes a direct threat to human well-being in all regions of the world. So as we looked at the mounting science around this biodiversity crisis. Um, those of us in the federal policy world uh, wondered how to raise the, uh, raise the alarm on this issue to legislators and other policymakers at the federal level to make sure that this was on their radar as something that needs to be addressed now. And at the beginning of this Congress back in early 2019, uh, the new freshman class came in with an enormous amount of enthusiasm around climate policy. Um, they saw this as an urgent and pressing matter, which it is, and they took action to, uh, you know, create plans to create legislation that would address it. And this was an opportunity to marry biodiversity to that topic because the two subjects are intrinsically related. So in all of our conversations on the Hill, we made the case that you cannot fix climate change without looking at these drastic declines in biodiversity. And we made that case by making three broad points. The first one, of course, is that climate change has a detrimental impact on species survival. 
again, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. There are so many examples to be mentioned here. Uh, you could look at hurricanes and other extreme weather events impacting migratory bird populations and damaging habitat. Uh, you could look at thinning sea ice as impacting Arctic species ability to hunt and to mate. Um, you could look at new patterns of drought that have forced species to move into different areas of habitat and have contributed to a 45% decrease in the number of invertebrates, which includes pollinators. Um, you could also look at sea level rise, warming and acidification that have affected a huge number of marine species. And you know, the list goes on. The second big point that we made was species decline due to climate change negatively impacts human well-being and survival. We're not just talking about saving wildlife for the sake of saving wildlife. We're talking about also doing it for our own sake, for the human species. And human communities and economies are so utterly dependent on resilient ecosystems and on healthy species populations. Extinction impacts our way of life from employment, to tourism, to food production, to the economy, to the spread of disease. Um, one example to look at is native insects. They provide $4.5 billion in pest control. They pollinate $3 billion in crops and are food for wildlife that support a multi-billion dollar outdoor recreation industry every year. These are things that are fundamental to our way of life and that wouldn't exist if those insect populations disappeared. We can also talk about public health. This is particularly relevant during 2020, of course. Um, for example, amphibian species, which are declining at an alarming rate, uh, nearly one third are already extinct or threatened with extinction. They help eat insects that, uh, that can be vectors for disease to humans. Uh, we see now burgeoning mosquito populations, and of course mosquitoes can carry West Nile virus and malaria. So these are all severe impacts on humans from a drop in wildlife populations. The third big point is that protecting species and their habitats can actually help offset some of the effects of climate change and make it easier for us to adapt to this changing world. Um, you know, going back to pollination, a third of our food is pollinated by birds, bats, and insects, and they are threatened by habitat loss, and by pesticide use, and this function will be increasingly vital as agriculture is challenged due to climate change. And if we don't have those pollinator populations, then our own food supply may dry up. Um, you can also look at wetland habitats, which host thriving ecosystems. And they're a really important buffer between human communities and rising water levels, looking at floods from sea level rise or from severe storms caused by climate change. And then plants and animals are also really important for carbon sequestration. You know, forests absorb a huge amount of carbon from the air and store it in a, in a way that does not contribute to climate change. A healthy kelp forests in the ocean provide the same function. They have the capacity to store billions of kilograms of carbon, but they're being ravaged by warmer ocean temperatures right now. So this, in broad strokes, was the argument that we brought to policymakers saying, you need to consider this no matter what climate plan you put forward. So these conversations and a lot of other advocacy work um, resulted in some great legislation, a lot of which is listed here. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over the first four, but I would be happy to answer questions about any of them afterward. Uh, the Safeguarding America's Future and Environment Act, or the SAFE Act, brings natural resources agencies together into a working group and tasks them with developing a national climate change adaptation strategy and in that strategy prioritizing specific conservation and management strategies for helping wildlife to acclimate to this new climate. The Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act would establish a national wildlife corridors system and this would allow federal agencies working with state and local partners to 
keep habitat connected, to prevent fragmentation so that animals can move across their range without being stopped by development, by infrastructure, things that get in the way of their free movement. The Extinction Prevention Act looks at species that are maybe not as charismatic as the elephants and tigers that tend to get the bulk of attention when we're talking about conservation. This bill would fund projects for protecting the North American butterfly, the Pacific Island plants, freshwater mussels, and Southwest desert fish that are each still really important components of their ecosystems, even if they're not quite as charismatic as like the snow leopard on this slide. Finally, the Paw and Fin Conservation Act would repeal the devastating regulatory changes that the Trump administration put in place last year. I'm going to go into more detail about those later on in this presentation, but I wanted to highlight that there is legislation to address those regulations. In addition to some really wonderful bills that have been introduced this Congress, uh, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which was formed back at the beginning of 2019, has also incorporated biodiversity into its work, which we were really pleased to see. So earlier this year, they put out an extremely comprehensive report, hundreds of pages, about what steps should be taken to solve climate change. And there's an entire section in there devoted to protecting biodiversity as a component of this larger strategy. You can see this quote pulled out here. They want to provide species the resources and tools to survive in the face of a changing climate. But at the same time, intact ecosystems are highly effective carbon sinks. So they provided a list of some potential options for how to do this. And you can see here that um, some of their suggestions align really closely with the legislation that I was just talking about. They also recommend establishing a wildlife corridor and connectivity system to allow species to be more adaptable in the habitat that they live on as temperatures change, as prey species move. Um, they also recommend improving implementation of the Endangered Species Act, which of course has been a really hot button topic um, during this administration. And then they have some recommendations about protecting landscape, protecting habitat, um, empowering private landowners to assist with those conservation efforts. So we were really thrilled to see uh, these recommendations coming out of this climate report. Now, we've been talking about some really good policy that has been advanced during this Congress. Unfortunately, now we're gonna turn to some of the attacks on the Endangered Species Act by this administration over the past four years. And I first want to go over the three rules which were uh, proposed and finalized as a package um, back in August of 2019. And by Trump administration, I'm really talking about the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the US National Marine Fisheries Service um, because those are the two agencies that have responsibility for implementing the ESA. So these three rules were lengthy, they were technical, but I've pulled out some of the main things that they did to the ESA regulations. Um, first of all, they curtailed protections that are afforded to threatened species. So the lower designation of protection below endangered species. Uh, they also allow economic data to be collected while deciding whether or not to list a species, even though economic data is not supposed to be considered when deciding whether a species should be listed. Uh, the new rules significantly weaken the process for designating protected habitat. It dismantles the interagency consultation process, which is when other agencies come to the services and say, we have a federal project we wanna do, how might this impact listed species? And these rules minimize consideration of the effects of climate change on species survival. And I really wanna focus on this for a moment because of course this is relevant to what we're discussing here. And without going too much in the weeds, what these rules did was change two definitions um, in how the ESA is implemented. The first is the definition of foreseeable future, which is used to determine whether to list a species as threatened. 
And the second is the definition of consequences caused by the proposed action which is a determination that's made during that interagency consultation process on whether a federal project might harm a listed species. And taken together, the narrowing of these two definitions uh, allows the services to circumvent consideration of climate change when they're enforcing the Endangered Species Act to say, this is not something that we are going to take into account when we're deciding what species need, and how best to protect them. And that is really short-sighted and really irresponsible because of how clear the science is on what climate change is doing to wildlife. And this year we have seen two additional proposed rules uh, proposed in August and September of this year. And both of them undermine the uh, critical habitat component of the ESA. So the first one provides a new definition of the word habitat. And uh, basically it says that if a uh, segment of a species habitat would require restoration in some way in order to be suitable for the species to live there, then the services can leave out that segment from their designation of critical habitat. And secondly, uh, the second rule says that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must exclude areas from designation of critical habitat when the economic benefits of using that land for something other than species conservation are greater than the economic benefits of using that land for species conservation. And of course, that's an unfair calculation because there is no good way to calculate economic benefits of preventing extinction. It is simply a, an intrinsic value that we want these species to live. So that was a really quick rundown of what the administration has been up to. Again, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions about those finalized and proposed rules. And with the last bit of my time, um, before I turn it over to the others, I wanna to touch on a bill that was just introduced called the Preventing Future Pandemics Act. Um, Kathy is going to talk a lot more in her presentation about that nexus between wildlife exploitation and public health, um, but I just wanted to make sure to mention some federal action on that front. So this bill was introduced on a bipartisan basis, um, Democrat and Republican in both the House and the Senate. Any of you who have worked with Congress know how difficult that is to, to get done. And it is, of course, a response to the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing this year and the fact that the majority of emerging infectious diseases jump to humans from animals. Uh, so what this bill does is it shuts down all live wildlife markets in the United States. It prohibits the import, export, and sale of wild live wildlife for human consumption within the U.S. And in addition, it puts resources and directs a diplomatic strategy for the United States abroad to assist other nations with also shutting down their wildlife, wildlife markets and transitioning communities in those nations who currently rely on wildlife for food to alternate sources of protein. Um, it also helps uh, with further cracking down on international wildlife trafficking by putting additional resources toward that purpose. And it is a step in the right direction toward acknowledging that our broken relationship with the natural world, the way we exploit nature, has not only devastating impacts for animals, for biodiversity, but also clearly devastating impacts for us. And we really need to rethink how we're treating animals and uh, you know, how we function in relation to wildlife and the earth. So I'm going to stop there because Kathy will get more into that topic. Um, and I appreciate all of you listening to this presentation and I will be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks for that great presentation, Kate.
I'm so glad this year's animal law conference is focused on climate change, as it is the issue that will have the greatest impact on all non-human animals, as well as on people. Whenever I hear someone say, we can't afford to do any of the key reforms needed to address climate change, I think, are you kidding? We can't afford not to do these things. We are already spending trillions of dollars trying to pick up the pieces from one intense weather emergency after another, hurricanes, wildfires, floods, and it is only going to get exponentially worse if we don't take drastic action quickly. The lesson we must learn from the pandemic is to act in advance. Don't ignore the science and the warning signs and wait until the devastation is painfully obvious to everyone. At that point, taking dramatic steps will be too late to avert catastrophe, just as our slowness to respond to the looming crisis of COVID-19 yielded disaster. With climate change feedback loops, it will become impossibly difficult to turn things around if we miss the crucial window of the next few years. But the heartening message from the pandemic is that it's shown us we can take very drastic action to change our lifestyles when we feel it's imperative to do so. Who would have imagined a year ago that the airline industry would be foundering because people suddenly decided not to take planes or that demand for gasoline would plummet because people were staying home en masse? The decline in fossil fuel use this year due to the pandemic may not be a long-term trend as people resume activities, but it showed us that we have the capacity to upend our habits in the face of a crisis. The challenge with climate change is to recognize that it is already upon us, and it is as dire as the scientists say, not to put off worrying about it. Now, there is a tendency sometimes in the animal protection movement to want to stay in our lane and focus only on issues that particularly impact animals without getting too deeply involved in environmental concerns that are the bailiwick of other organizations. But climate change is not just an environmental issue or a social justice issue for the marginalized who will bear the brunt of its devastation. Climate change will also directly hurt all animals, wildlife, of course, but all others too especially the most vulnerable, just as is the case for human populations. One of the ways we at Humane Society Legislative Fund are tackling this challenge is on the mitigation side, working to ensure that there are adequate disaster plans to protect animals in extreme weather events. Not including animals in disaster planning can lead to terrible outcomes. We saw this in 2005, when more than 600,000 animals were abandoned after Hurricane Katrina. Also, many people refused to evacuate and some lost their lives because they couldn't bring their companion animals with them. Following that tragedy, we pushed Congress to pass the Pets Act, which requires state and local authorities to take into account and plan for the needs of individuals with household pets and service animals before, during, and after a disaster. But the Pets Act does not cover commercially owned animals. Given the increasing frequency and intensity of weather-related events, as well as the COVID-19 crisis and potential for serious staffing shortages, it's crucial that facilities think through how to handle tasks such as evacu evacuation, shelter in place, provision of backup food and water, sanitation, ventilation, and veterinary care. A lack of advanced planning can subject animals to awful hardship. It can also jeopardize public safety and impose an undue burden on first responders, the local community, and NGOs that assist with rescue efforts, as well as exact a heavy cost on the businesses themselves. We can't let those who are profiting from animals externalize the costs of climate change. We are working closely with the bipartisan sponsors of the PREPARED Act, Representatives Dina Titus and Peter King, to require facilities regulated under the Animal Welfare Act, commercial animal dealers, exhibitors, and research labs to submit annual contingency plans to USDA outlining the steps they will take to care for their animals during emergencies such as natural disasters, pandemics, power outages, and animal escapes. 
Disaster plans are already required for facilities doing NIH funded research and for labs and zoos under certain accreditation programs. This bill will level the playing field and ensure that puppy mills, roadside zoos, and other outliers also have plans in place. The PREPARED Act already has strong bipartisan support with 216 co-sponsors, almost half the House. But we know that the Agriculture Committee, which has jurisdiction over the PREPARED Act, hardly ever moves freestanding animal protection bills. We've been successful getting some legislation enacted through that committee in the context of farm bills, but those only get done every five years or so. With that in mind, we're pursuing a dual track strategy, seeking a directive in annual appropriations legislation that controls USDA's budget, as well as pushing to get the Prepared Act passed. Congress must enact appropriation bills every year under the Constitution, so that's a path we pursue for many of our priority issues. The common sense idea to require disaster plans for AWA regulated facilities has been on the table for many years. USDA first proposed a rule to accomplish this during the Bush administration in 2008 and finalized it in 2012 with facilities due to have their plans ready by mid 2013. But in response to a Washington Post story about a magician and his rabbit, which noted concern about very small businesses being covered, USDA issued a stay of imp implementation of this final rule just two days after facilities were supposed to have their plans in place. We worked with Congress to address this concern. The conference report for the 2014 Farm Bill told USDA to lift its stay without delay once the agency set a de minimis exemption from the Animal Welfare Act for facilities with just a few non-dangerous animals, like the magician and his rabbit. USDA established that exemption in June 2018, but it has not yet lifted the stay. The Prepared Act would essentially codify USDA's 2012 rule. While we'd like to have this be a matter of permanent law, if Congress tells the agency to lift its stay and begin enforcing the rule, that gets us pretty much the same result. Earlier this year, we were able to get a bipartisan group of 207 representatives and 41 senators to request language directing USDA to lift the stay on its contingency rule. This was part of a joint letter to the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee that I've coordinated each of the past 20 years, working with Hill Champions, which covers a range of animal protection provisions. And this year's letter had a record-breaking number of co-signers. With that demonstration of support, and thanks to the superb leadership of House Subcommittee Chairman Sanford Bishop and his extraordinary staff, the fiscal year 2021 bill that passed the House in July includes this language. We hope the Senate will agree and it will be enacted as part of a final omnibus package so that puppy mills, roadside zoos, and other enterprises will soon have emergency response plans and be ready if disaster strikes. And we hope that this will jumpstart discussions of how to require disaster planning for industrial scale farms, where we've seen awful tragedies, such as thousands of pigs and millions of chickens and turkeys trapped in barns during floods, left to drown or starve and suffer slow, horrific deaths. There's a terrible disincentive in the current system the animals may be worth more dead than alive, following a hurricane, for example, because they can't be processed for food once they've been contaminated by floodwaters, whereas the producer can abandon them and then file an insurance claim. Now, figuring out how to protect or relocate all those animals in advance of a storm is no small task, but it ought to be part of the cost of operating such a business. Maybe then those running these enterprises would rethink the wisdom of operating factory farms in the first place, or they might become vocal advocates demanding strong action to address climate change. As many of you know, addressing farmed animal issues is particularly difficult in Congress. Agribusiness holds powerful sway on Capitol Hill, often on a bipartisan basis. We saw this firsthand in 2009 when we tried to back up the early efforts of the Obama administration's EPA 
to track greenhouse gas emissions from con concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. Of course, industrial animal agriculture is a major contributor to the climate change problem. As far back as 2006, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization sounded the alarm that animal agriculture contributed 18% of human-induced global greenhouse gas emissions, more than the entire transportation sector. Industrial anim animal agriculture systems are extremely fossil fuel intensive, requiring massive amounts of fertilizer, pesticides, and machinery for planting and harvesting feed crops, transporting animals and finished products, and heating and cooling CAFOs. Livestock production uses about 70% of agricultural land, with deforestation eliminating crucial carbon sinks to clear space for soybeans and corn to be grown as animal feed. Ruminant animals such as cows have bacteria in their stomachs to ferment food, emitting a lot of methane when they burp and pass gas. And methane and nitrous oxide, both far more potent greenhouse gas, gases than carbon dioxide, are released during anaerobic decomposition of animal manure. As EPA noted in 2007, the shift toward confining livestock in facilities that use liquid manure management systems contributed to significant increases in both methane and nitrous oxide emissions. Rather than taking responsibility for its role in the climate crisis and adopting reforms that could reduce the harm, agribusiness has worked overtime to prevent data collection that would implicate it. In 2009, they got their allies in Congress to block EPA's rule on mandatory reporting of greenhouse gases from manure management systems at CAFOs EPA's rule would have exempted thousands of small farmers. Only the 90 largest operations in the country would have had to report. This rule followed a sensible directive by Congress the year before for EPA to gather greenhouse gas emissions data for major facilities in all sectors of the economy so that Congress could craft effective climate policy based on sound science and a thorough understanding of the problem. Republican Representative Tom Latham of Iowa proposed a rider on the Interior Appropriations Bill to tie EPA's hands so the agency couldn't gather data on these CAFO emissions. It was narrowly approved on a 31 to 27 vote by the House Appropriations Committee. We quickly mobilized a coalition of dozens of environmental, animal protection, sustainable agriculture, and consumer groups to fight this. Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein of California led the charge masterfully in committee, defeating a parallel rider sought by Republican Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas by a vote of 18 to 12. But then agribusiness leaned on its allies on both sides of the aisle in the House and won a floor vote to retain the Latham Amendment in the final package. As I recall, it was about an hour later that the Senate caved to the House position and in the years since 2009, EPA has repeatedly been barred from collecting this data. During the House floor debate, those railing against the EPA rule were all Republicans, but they won the 267 to 147 vote on a bipartisan basis, pressing colleagues with rural constituents to stop what they characterized as a terrible regulatory cost on farmers and ranchers. Now, 11 years later, we see the cost of inaction as, for example, farms in Iowa lost all their crops in August to a storm that researchers say was so severe due to climate change. By forcing EPA to put up blinders, agribusiness avoided being held accountable, but the problem hasn't gone away and it's affecting rural states more and more. We need solid data to better understand how emissions of carbon dioxide Methane and nitrous oxide are affected by different agricultural practices and make corresponding changes to reduce harmful impacts. I hope we'll be able to revisit the data collection issue in the new Congress. We also need to stop subsidizing the worst practices and step up support for more humane, sustainable farming that generates lower greenhouse gas emissions. As many farmers are struggling financially, this can be a growth opportunity. For a lot of producers, the main hurdle to converting is the upfront cost of retrofitting facilities. 
federal subsidies, research grants, and procurement for the military, federal prisons, school lunches, and other programs can all be used to encourage a swift transition to cage-free and crate-free production systems and to accelerate development of plant-based and cultivated meat alternatives to help expand choices in the marketplace. There should be a moratorium on taxpayers' bailouts for CAFOs and a reallocation of some of the subsidies that now go to crops fed to farm animals at a higher toll to the environment and heavier use of resources than growing plant foods directly for people. And we must reverse USDA's allowance of ever faster line speeds at slaughter plants, which is a shameless sop to industrial agriculture. Slowing down the slaughter lines is vital to protect animals, food safety, and workers, particularly during the pandemic, when plant employees are being required to work despite grave health risks. The new Congress presents a fresh opportunity to tackle the climate change crisis. Of course, there's the new Green Deal, and there are many other promising proposals waiting in the wings. For example, the Clean Economy Jobs and Innovation Act that passed the House last month to put Americans to work building clean energy products and technologies. The Climate Stewardship Act would dramatically scale up investments in reforestation and improved wildlife habitat connectivity, urban tree cover, wetlands restoration, renewable energy for farmers and rural small businesses, and farm and ranch conservation practices that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sequestration. The Farm System Reform Act would put a moratorium on new and expanding CAFOs and phase out the largest operations by 2040. The End Polluter Welfare Act would close tax loopholes and eliminate other federal subsidies for fossil fuel industries. There are proposals for a carbon tax with rebates to citizens and for tax incentives to boost clean energy and efficiency improvements. Bills have been introduced to pay into the UN's Green Climate Fund for developing countries and to protect climate migrants. These are just some of the bills introduced on this crucial topic. There's no shortage of good ideas. It's time for decisive action. And I fervently hope that people from across the political spectrum will demand this. Climate change doesn't stop at state borders or hurt only blue states. We can't allow climate change deniers to prevail in casting this as a partisan political issue. It's not. It will affect each and every one of us and every animal. We all have a stake in tackling the challenge in a meaningful and timely way. John McCain acknowledged this when he spoke out as the Republican presidential nominee in 2008, saying, the facts of global warming demand our urgent attention, especially in Washington. Just as we need people of all political stripes to engage on this, so too, we need people of all ages to step up. 18-year-old activist Jamie Margolin made this point in a compelling op-ed published in the Washington Post at the end of March, which ran under the original headline, the coronavirus will kill you, climate change will kill us. You can find the full piece at the handouts tab to the right of your screen, and it's worth reading. She rightly points out that her generation is sacrificing to help protect elderly, more vulnerable people who are at disproportionate risk of dying from COVID-19. And she wants older generations to give young people the same consideration when it comes to climate change. She calls on leaders to quit making excuses that we can't transform our economy that fast noting that, quote, the pandemic has blown their cover. It has exposed how government leaders and the American public actually can make immediate dramatic behavioral changes, even when those changes have serious consequences for the economy and our way of life. It's just that until now, they haven't been willing to. She urges that instead of returning to our, quote, old comfortable pattern of destroying the planet, we can take this opportunity to restructure our economy and society in a way that will ensure today's children can live. Wise words. We all need to commit to this fight and the animal protection movement can and should play a key role.
Thank you for the opportunity to join in this important discussion. As has been a common theme during the conference, when we discuss climate change, we must address industrial farming, environmental degradation, and the balance of nature. During this segment, we will be reviewing state legislation and regulations that both directly and indirectly affect animals. But I would first like to begin by addressing how the political climate has changed this year as well. Not only have we been facing unprecedented wildfires, hurricanes, and other natural disasters that have taken a tremendous toll on the environment, human, and animal lives, but we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Just as the coronavirus has closed workplaces and curtailed activities in many different areas of life, state legislatures have faced similar challenges. In 2020, many state legislative sessions were suspended by COVID-19, and some completely stalled. Currently, 10 states are in their regular session, with another six states that have enacted special sessions. As you could imagine, this has complicated advocacy efforts. So we've shifted focus to advance legislation where possible and framing with COVID-19 when appropriate. COVID concerns continue to dictate legislative agendas and economic hardships will lessen the chance of any bill passing that has a fiscal note attached. In response to COVID-19, ALDF has generated a white paper, which we encourage you to view. The paper includes policy recommendations addressing animal exploitation, access to safe and plant-focused food, equitable resource allocation, and climate change. So now let's jump into state legislative initiatives. And this is by no means a comprehensive list, but it does provide an overview of our collective efforts. So for farmed animals, as we discuss climate change, we must also address the structural injustice of the animal agriculture systems, the threat they pose for future pandemics and their environmental impact. Let's begin with live markets. Live markets are characterized by sequestering a diversity of animals into confined areas, packing and stacking them on top of one another. The physiological stresses that animals endure from such confinement itself weakens their immune responses to pathogens, and as a consequence, they're much more likely to become vectors of disease. Given the public's interaction with animals in these conditions, live markets undoubtedly increase the risk that a human will come into contact with a pathogen that ultimately results in a zoonotic disease. In New York this year, we saw two bills at the state level that address live markets. The first provides an extension to a previous four-year moratorium on licensing new live markets, allowing an additional four-year prohibition. This bill was signed into law in August. The other New York State bill would permanently halt new licenses and establish a task force on public health risks and animal welfare concerns. While this bill did not progress, it will be reintroduced in the 2021 session. Of note, according to local sources, New York City has approximately 80 live bird markets. These brick and mortar establishments are often in very high density neighborhoods where they slaughter animals on site and sell to the public. This then brings us to hen welfare. And just as animals confined in live markets are severely stressed, so too are hens on factory farms, but on a much, much greater scale. The overwhelming majority of hens are confined in barren battery cages, enclosures so small that the birds are unable to even spread their wings without touching the cage sides or other hens. And living in such conditions is terrible and terribly cruel on its own, uh, but it is also incredibly stressful. As a result, producers are compelled to continually feed animals antibiotics as preventive disease treatment, 
being the only practical way to prevent a mass sickness. In the United States, up to 80% of the antibiotics produced are fed to farmed animals to treat disease as well as promote growth. This widespread routine use of antibiotics presents environmental concerns not only with using their manure as fertilizer, but the waste runoff from factory farms permeates water supplies, leading to bacterial contamination of rivers and streams, which may impact fish and wildlife. Thankfully, there's a strong coalition of animal protection organizations, which has incredible success with state legislation that aims to eliminate the cruel cage confinement of egg laying hens and require eggs produced and sold in the state be cage free. Colorado passed an historic bill this year, joining six other states that passed a cage free law. Those include Michigan, Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, California, and Rhode Island. Next up is the gestation crate ban. And when we're talking about factory farms, we're talking about large industrial facilities where hundreds to hundreds of thousands of animals are kept and raised in confinement to maximize profits. At hog farms, one way they do this is by using gestation crates. And these are metal cages that keep impregnated female pigs so intensively confined that she cannot stand up, turn around, nor lie down freely. In New Jersey, a gestation crate ban bill is back on the agenda, and we're optimistic that it will have some movement before the end of this year. With mega dairies, Oregon is in the midst of a mega dairy crisis. Facilities where thousands of cows are confined in cramped and filthy conditions are polluting the air, the water, affecting the climate and hurting animals. While we are supporting a mega dairy moratorium, we are also opposing permits. ALDF is part of a coalition that filed a legal petition urging limitations on water use as exemptions have allowed dairies unlimited water in Eastern Oregon and new facilities aim to build in critical groundwater areas. We're also opposing fish farms as industrial fish farming facilities can threaten coastal ecosystems. When tons of fish are crowded together, they create a lot of waste which can pollute the ocean. Fish farms can also be breeding grounds for disease and have the same issue with overuse of antibiotics. There are two facilities being considered, one off the coast of Florida and the other off the coast of New York. Next, we're going to move on to the environment, even though you could argue that all of these issues overlap, but uh, with a general lack of federal EPA efforts to regulate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, many states have committed to reducing emissions through their own legislation. At least 15 states have binding plans aimed at reducing emissions with California, New York, Nevada, Colorado, Maine, and Oregon at the forefront. Many have designated agencies or working groups to determine which industries to target, and these are primarily energy and transportation. But we know that farming and agriculture contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions. And why am I mentioning this? Because it presents an opportunity, but that opportunity lies on both sides. Corporations are actively urging lawmakers to drive policy and create incentives for developing new technologies to achieve aggressive reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So we must ensure that future policies actually fix the problem and don't boost industrial agriculture while partnering with dirty energy. I'd also like to note the passage of single-use plastic bag bans, as reducing plastic bag use can mitigate harmful impacts to oceans, rivers, lakes, forests, and the wildlife that inhabit them. Uh, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Maine, New York, Oregon, and Vermont have all enacted laws and a bill is expected to be signed in New Jersey as well. We're also working to pass fur bans. Not only is there inherent cruelty in this industry, but environmental degradation as well. Fur production involves numerous toxic chemicals 
heavy metals, including carcinogens like chromium and formaldehyde, which leach into the, in the environment and can also harm workers. Farms create tremendous amounts of waste that contaminate the soil and waterways, contributing to climate change as well. As we're merging this conversation with COVID-19, it bears noting that one million minks have been killed globally at minx farms as a result of, of the pandemic. Uh, our efforts at, include supporting coalition campaigns in Rhode Island and Hawaii and local efforts in Massachusetts, where we're likely to see a state bill in 2021. A few other notables on the environmental front that I would like to mention. California Governor Newsom was eyeing a water resilience portfolio, and that was aimed at helping the state manage the expected effects of climate change on its water supply. This policy was held due to COVID, but it highlights the need for accountability related to water consumption. And we do hope that this issue will be addressed next session. In addition, the Good Food Purchasing Program which encourages large institutions to direct their buying power toward local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare and nutrition are having some really good successes at the local level as well. I'd also like to acknowledge the coalition that's working to oppose labeling bills that aim to censor the use of meat and dairy terms on the labels of plant-based foods, which of course are less carbon intensive and cruelty free. So we're going to move on to the balance of nature. In wildlife killing contests, also known as derbies or tournaments, where participants compete to kill as many animals as they can during a specified time period for cash and prizes, wildlife agencies and professionals across the country have expressed concerns about killing contests because they contravene modern science-based wildlife management principles and are destructive to healthy ecosystems within which all wildlife species play a crucial role. And we're actively working with coalitions in New Jersey and New York to pass wildlife killing contest bans. The same goes for bear hunting, which is made more egregious at a time when we should be protecting wildlife and restoring the balance of nature. In Florida last year, the coalition successfully opposed authorization of a 2020 black bear hunt. In New Jersey, Governor Murphy just announced that he intends to halt black bear hunts by not approving a management plan that includes lethal methods in 2021. However, with those two successes, unfortunately, we have a state like Missouri that is now making plans to begin hunting black bears. And this is after 30 years without a hunt. The public comment period is now open through November 14th. And a few of our organizations have action alerts out, which we would encourage you to sign if you live in the state or share with anyone you know in Missouri. So for shark fin bans, uh, climate change is having an effect on reefs and ecosystems, which in itself is harming shark populations. When you combine that with a terribly cruel practice of finning, capturing a shark to cut off their fins and discard the shark back into the ocean, it could have dire consequences. We're seeing that declining shark populations are harming whole ecosystems. But some positive news is that a shark fin bill did pass this year in Florida. In addition, two toxic chemical bills recently passed in California. In September, the California Ecosystem Protection Act passed, significantly limiting the use of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides to protect the state's native wildlife as rodents who consume these poisons are in turn consumed by other wildlife, resulting in secondary poisoning and contamination of the food chain. In addition, a ban on personal care products that contain toxic chemicals banned by the EU was also signed into law. Now the rates of nature may be new to some, and the concept is that rather than treating nature as property under the new law, rights of nature acknowledges that nature in all of its forms has the right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles. In the US, over three dozen cities, towns, and counties have adopted local laws recognizing the rights of ecosystems. The largest town is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and county is Mora County, New Mexico. Several tribes in the US also recognize legally enforceable rights of ecosystems, 
in Minnesota, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin. We are also currently supporting the Right to Clean Water Initiative in Orange County, Florida. And next, I'd like to touch upon a few bills that are more animal centric. Uh, as for disaster response, we're supporting bills that prohibit the tethering of animals during natural disasters, specifically a bill in Florida. And animals in motor vehicles, while this is not a concept born out of climate change, the rise in global temperature does put animals who are left unattended in vehicles at increased risk. We're currently working on a New Jersey bill. And sentience, I think we need to include this as we're committed to advocating for animals' legal status. And it is long overdue that we declare that animals are sentient beings capable of experiencing pain, stress, and fear. And to have each animal treated as an individual victim of animal cruelty crimes in a court of law. This should apply to all animals so that we can better protect the animals themselves and perhaps by extension, the environment they live in. So the bottom line is that we need to craft policy solutions that will create transformative change and social conditions that are more humane, equitable, and sustainable. And while it may seem like there are great hills to climb before we achieve a universal recognition of our interconnectedness, Perhaps we're now at a precipice of a tipping point, which could result in expedited actions by policymakers that will meaningfully protect animals in their habitat to restore nature. That's why now more than ever, we must all participate in the legislative process. You have arguably the most powerful and persuasive voice, especially at the state level, where as a constituent, you can establish a personal relationship with your legislators and their staff. We encourage you to reach out if you have interest in advocating for any of the issues that were covered and hope that you will continue to use your voice to benefit the animals and the world that we live in. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking all of our wonderful panelists today. I know I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. Um, we're going to start with a few questions for our question and answer session. If you have any other questions that come up as we are discussing, please feel free to submit those via the Q&A tab on the right hand side of your screen. So to start, I'm going to go to Kate. Um, we have some attendees interested in learning more about the federal efforts that you were not able to discuss um, in your talk, including the Wild Bird Conservation Reauthorization Act. So wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Sure. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'm glad to have a little extra time here to dive into some of the legislation I wasn't able to talk about. Um, and the three bills that I included in that list but didn't touch on are very similar in that they provide additional funding to conservation programs for specific species. So the Wild Bird Conservation Reauthorization Act would reauthorize a fund called the Exotic Bird Conservation Fund, which was actually established back in 1992 by a law called the Wild Bird Conservation Act, but it was never funded. And so this would provide grants to projects that are intended to protect wild birds in their native countries. So this is international conservation work um, for the development and implementation of conservation programs. Um, secondly, the Salamander Act would reauthorize the Fish and Wildlife Services Amphibians Program, which for six years earlier this decade provided competitive grants to projects benefiting the conservation of frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, and other amphibians. Um, and it also establishes the Highly Endangered Amphibian Species Conservation Fund, um, which similar to the wild bird bill, supports activities related to recovering and maintaining healthy amphibian populations around the globe. And finally, the Critically Endangered Animals Conservation Fund, uh, these all have very long names, would reestablish a fund that was previously in existence that supports on the ground conservation projects for some other imperiled species. Um, this was administered from 2009 to 2014 by Fish and Wildlife Service, but was discontinued due to funding cuts. And it was wildly successful at the time. It had a great record of success, supported over 100 conservation programs globally. And so we would be really excited to be able to restart that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, next up, this question is for Mimi. 
Um, I'm wondering if you can speak about any current federal animal protection bills that are not so directly related to climate change and what else is going on at the federal level. Um, thank you all for your great talks. And uh, and um, I did want to direct folks to the handouts section if they want. I included um, our current uh, HSLF, Humane Society Legislative Fund's current um, legislative priorities list, our uh, priority bills, and also um, a link to a, a, an appropriations letter that I mentioned in my talk that covered a whole lot of different issues. Um, so I'll just touch on a few. Um, we, we work on a, a whole host of different things and climate change is just a teeny piece of it. So um, I work a lot on the horse soaring issue. We have the, uh, the past act uh, preventing Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act that passed in the House and would make the changes needed um, to get rid of this cruel practice that is um, affecting Tennessee walking horses and, and other show horses. Um, we're also working a lot on the horse racing issue, which has become so current with so many horses experiencing fatalities on racetracks. Um, the horse slaughter, of course, remains a big issue. Um, we have we have majority supporting efforts to make horse slaughter uh, illegal in this country, but it's always been a challenge to get floor time um, consideration for that. Um, on the animal research side, we're focusing a lot on uh, humane cosmetics, which is an area that um, there's there's widespread agreement around the world that we don't need to be testing on animals um, for for cosmetics. There's plenty of alternatives available, and they are actually much more efficient and uh, cheaper for um, for business to develop um, and and better, m more reliable indicators of um, of the uh, safety for human use. Um, uh, Shark finning is a big issue on the wildlife side. Um, we are trying to um, finally shut down the trade of, um, of sharks being, um, having their fins cut off and thrown back in the water to die a, a really horrible death um, that is also destabilizing um, ecosystems as they're the apex predators. Um, the um, Standards at puppy mills have not been upgraded in a meaningful way for decades, and the Puppy Protection Act would um, would get at that, dealing with um, really basic things, uh, making sure that um, dogs aren't stacked in cages, aren't in, with wire wire um, bottoms on the cages that hurt their feet, and that they have room to run and exercise, and that they get treated promptly when they have a, an illness or disease uh, or an injury um, and um, just to, just to touch on a few things on the on the approach front that again are referenced in that letter that is in the attachments um, we've um, been very pleased that we've been successful to be able to get launched in the farm bill the last farm bill a new program for um, for domestic violence uh, survivors to be able to flee their homes and bring their pets with them because there's such a uh, dearth of facilities that can take domestic violence survivors and, and have their pets with them. Um, and sometimes that's a question of having the facility be able to take the pets in right there, um, or maybe arranging, making foster arrangements, but helping uh, those fleeing a dangerous situation to be able to flee because right now they are um, abusers often take advantage of the very strong bond that may be the, the, the lifeline for the for the abuse victim and they'll threaten the pet. Sometimes they will actually uh, hurt the pet or kill the pet to demonstrate, you know, you could be next. Um, so we've gotten a new grant program launched for that, and we're getting appropriations for that. Um, I uh, also on the appropriations front, we work a lot on enforcement of um, the key animal welfare laws, the Animal Welfare Act, 
and the Horse Protection Act that deals with the horse soaring problem that I mentioned before. Um, and um, we've boosted funding over the years for these enforcement efforts, but also are, are working on trying to deal with problems in the way USDA carries out the enforcement or their lack of enforcement. Um, and one of the, the more recent issues that has that bubbled up at the beginning of this administration was um, USDA's purge of all the data so that um, animal activists and groups and the media and members of Congress couldn't see who who's committing the violations, um, just having no access to that information. And so we, we did work successfully um, with Chairman Sanford Bishop, who I mentioned in my talk, um, Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee and his wonderful staff to get a directive to USDA that they have to repost all that information. Um, and we're still working around the edges to make sure that it's really viable, uh, that all the information is there. And, and Delcy Winders, who's involved in this conference, has been a, a great, great partner in that effort. Um, and etc. There's a, just a whole lot of things. So if anybody wants to ask about any particular a bill or issue, I'd be happy to take any further questions on. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I think in an otherwise very difficult year, it's really encouraging to hear about all the great efforts going on on, on all different levels. Um, and speaking of which, Kathy, I'll direct this one to you. Um, how can attendees get started lobbying their legislators for a change for animals? I think often the term lobbying sounds really overwhelming and people aren't sure how to get involved in that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And you begin at the beginning. And so we would ask folks to do a little bit of research. Um, I, I think all of our organizations have some form of a lobby 101 for uh, for those folks that perhaps are, are new to outreach to their legislators. Uh, but you can also go on to your state's legislative website and research who your legislators are. You often just type in your address and out will uh, populate the people that represent you. Um, when we talk about our advocacy work, we're talking about a few different levels and it can be the local level, your town or uh, city council, perhaps a county uh, uh, commission or, or parish. Uh, and then you have the state representatives, your Senate, most are bicameral, your Senate and your, your house members, uh, except for Nebraska, you're unicameral and you just have a senator. Uh, and then at the federal level, and often people will, will confuse the state and federal representatives. And again, that's the House uh, and the Senate in Congress. And so if you can determine who your legislators are first, and then begin with initial outreach, phone call, email, uh, just say, as a constituent, I am interested in having a conversation about issues that are important to me. And oftentimes you'll have that first meeting, you can talk about one specific issue or a few just to find out what their positions are. And from there, you build on that relationship. It's really important to establish a relationship first. Uh, and, and again, it can be top down, bottom up. At the local level, you may have a better chance of moving uh, uh, in ordinance of resolution, um, perhaps for, you know, for, for any of the issues that we talked about today. And that in combination with a few other uh, ordinances within the state could rise to this snowball of interest in a state bill. Top down, it takes a little bit longer at the federal level as, as Mimi was saying, and Kate too, um, but we have to be consistent with our approach at the federal level. And if you have a really great administration, there may be more opportunities to move uh, uh, bills at that time. But again, it takes a lot longer at the federal level. And so uh, I would urge everyone to find out who their representatives are, um, find out what their state sessions are a month, two years, uh, anywhere in between, and then, uh, do a little bit of research on, on your own state laws. The Animal Legal Defense Fund has an annual 
uh, state ranking report that you can reference and then research the issue so that uh, you will be knowledgeable. And of course, reach out to any one of us. We are more than happy um, to walk you through the issues and, and again, how best to network with your legislators. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, it looks like we have time for about one more question. Um, so I'll address this one to Kate, but everyone else feel free to join in if you have other thoughts as well. Um, one of our attendees wants to know, is there anything that we can do to help fight against the unjust changes to the Endangered Species Act? That's a great question. Um, obviously, these are really concerning. These are things that we all want to see struck down or repealed. Um, for the specific administrative actions that I talked about, um, each of those was a proposed rule put forward, by, excuse me, by the cat, the cat cameo here. <laughs> um, each of those was a specific federal proposed rule that had an open comment period at the time when we and other organizations certainly solicited input from our members um, to let those federal agencies know that there was a lot of opposition to those rules. Uh, those comment periods have closed, but uh, a lot of organizations are still pursuing a legal strategy. Um, so I would also say that if you are in any way able to financially support any of the organizations that have gone to court over these new rules uh, that have weakened the Endangered Species Act, um, that's a slow process, but a really important process um, to be able to litigate on this. And then also we and other groups have fought off a lot of similar attacks in Congress, um, particularly over the past four years. And we try and keep our members as up to date as possible. We'll send out action alerts, we'll post on social media. When there's an opportunity to write into your representative and senators in Congress and say, we don't like this piece of legislation. We know that it would be bad for wildlife. We don't want to see it pass. So um, I would encourage all of you to certainly subscribe to the action alerts from the Animal Welfare Institute and other groups. There's a whole big coalition that works on these issues so that we can all keep you up to date when there is relevant action to take. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we are at the cusp of a new Congress coming in and then, and um, potentially a new administration, and it, it does afford an opportunity. I think everybody's, you know, going to be looking at what's going to be the agenda for the coming Congress and the coming administration. And um, climate change has has become an issue that is, you know, it's been featured in all of the presidential debates, and and that's a that's a new thing. And so, but that's because the public has demanded it, and for ESA and for you know for all the different issues we talk we've talked about it's a it's hearing from constituents is what drives that so we want people to be out there making noise absolutely well thank you all so much for joining us today and thank you to our panelists kate mimi and kathy for this really informative wonderful session